All right, well, we can start. Uh, and the first few slides are not really, let's say, the most important part of the, the core is, uh, is just a few slides after this. So if somebody comes later, they will not miss much. OK, so uh, well, I was here yesterday, and I, I can see some of you have already participated to the previous presentation. Uh, Today we are talking about uh, um, an open source infrastructure for uh, IoT, for the Internet of Things. Um, I'm not showing you anything specific, let's say, not, no hands on the keyboard. Uh, it will be a very generic presentation from this point of view, but I really hope that uh, there will be some outcome, something you can take home, and it can be helpful for you. I really, really hope so. Um, first of all, let me... Let me introduce again, maybe uh, some of you have not participated to the presentation yesterday. Uh, uh, my name is Ivan Zarati, and I'm part of a company which is a startup uh, in the Silicon Valley in uh, Menlo Park called Dynamic Systems. Uh, we have a very, very simple to understand uh, but a challenging mission, which is the simplification of data in IoT, data in the Internet of Things. It looks like, oh, what is so complicated? Well, there are lots and lots of complications. And maybe, I hope, actually, that after this presentation, that will be, will be clear for you. Uh, the, the name comes from the Greek, which means distribution or distributed from dianomy. And the most important, uh, the, uh, the domain was available for, uh, for very little money. So that was great. We couldn't believe that. We were so lucky. OK. Um, Oh, no, I don't want to show you this in a minute. First of all, we're talking about IoT and IoT infrastructures. Uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, by the way, if you have uh, questions and maybe you're not confident with uh, English, and I, you can hear I'm not a native English speaker, I'm Italian, uh, but I mean, if you are, are more confident to ask in Spanish, I mean, I, I can kind of understand it a little bit, or I'm sure I will get some help. So don't be afraid, don't be worried, you know, you want to have, a, you want to ask a question, please do it, and do it in also in your own language. Uh, um, who has been involved or is involved now in some projects uh, related to the Internet of Things, IoT projects? Okay, two people, all right. Um, let's see, who defines himself as a, or herself as a, as a DBA here. Database administrators? Okay. DevOps? Okay. Developers? Just developers? All right. Okay. Just a general question, just to understand uh, the audience, etc. Well, first of all, I think it's important uh, to talk about IoT here in Barcelona, because I don't know if you are aware, this is, uh, I, have, uh, I have three slides that are just uh, on the same subject. Uh, Barcelona is the most important city in terms of Internet of Things, uh, in terms of smart cities. Uh, if you don't have time to read all the other links, uh, this is uh, a five minutes video, uh, which is uh, like a summary of what happened in Barcelona uh, um, for uh, like the review of uh, the smart city with objectives that have been achieved. There was this concept of the super blocks, uh, in the way they, they organized the uh, blocks of the city and different manzanas all in blocks that uh, helped uh, in uh, increasing the pedestrian space, uh, in reducing the noise, uh, and in reducing pollution in general. So it's, uh, it's uh, a living proof that uh, by applying technology to, your ev to everyday life, uh, it's good uh, in many ways. And again, as I said yesterday, not only because your Fitbit keep you healthy you know, and uh, active, but also in things that maybe you don't see straight away. Um, and if you have more time to read that, uh, you can go and check the Financial Times, that they have, of course, their business perspective, uh, or uh, other, other um, um, websites, etc. It is uh, really number one project that then has been expanded to cities in uh, North America, South America, in India, rest of Asia, etc. So it's really, really important. And it's good that, uh, of course, uh, they're doing here in, uh, in Europe and specifically in Barcelona. Uh, now, that said, 
let's dig into the concept of the Internet of Things and the concept of the industrial Internet of Things. These are two very, very important aspects. Of course, IoT is the main generic um, um, topic, but then there is a, a kind of a uh, more detailed uh, aspect, which is uh, the second one. So, Internet of Things, let's make it super simple. We are talking about uh, connecting together not just uh, people, not just humans with their computers or their smartphones, but also things that do it autonomously. Sometimes they are wearables, as I presented the Fitbit or uh, your uh, uh, Apple Watch or other stuff. Sometimes uh, they are literally sensors or devices that live on their own somewhere. The example of, uh, of Barcelona is the fact that uh, you may have literally small data center in the middle of a street. You don't realize it, you don't know that, but you see the pillars and inside those pillars there are boards that are running, they're powered and there is uh, computing and storage inside that. That is uh, the kind of things that, again, they're hidden but they're happening around you. And this aspect is mostly related to what they call IIoT, Industrial Internet of Things. Now, and, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the next few slides. This is probably the, mo the scariest slide that uh, somebody can show on the topic. It's not from, uh, you know, the Gardner guys or whatever. No, it's coming from Cisco, who are probably number one in IoT, and they say, 75% of the IoT projects uh, are failing. So you think, okay, there are like millions of euros or dollars or anything invested, and I know that I have uh, three out of four possibilities to fail. How cool is that? Not very much, right? Um, why is that? Why is this uh, um, prediction or not prediction? I mean, this is uh, really a survey that they have done with their customers. So it's not, again, surveys from Gartner checking here and there. They go and talk to customers and they say, hey, here there have been failures. Well, first of all, you can read the whole article, but secondly and more important is this. In uh, IoT, and again, if you look at uh, um, people, human beings uh, using their things, uh, it's okay to uh, buy new stuff, okay, you want to change your, fo uh, your phone, you want to change your, uh, your watch, or you want to install a new thermostat at home, and uh, you already have an old version, it's okay, because you take care of it. It's one thing for you, or ten things for you. In the industrial world, uh, it's not that easy. First of all, it's a, it's a world where there are uh, millions, if not billions, of uh, euros in investment uh, that go on from uh, the 50s, like 1950, 1960, and on and on and on until now. And you see infrastructures that are uh, 60 or 70 years old, and they're still there, and they're running. And they cannot change it. They cannot say, all right, now let's remove everything, like you buy a new iPhone or a new, uh, a new Android phone. It's, uh, it's way more complicated. It's something that takes literally years uh, also to just uh, decide that uh, things must be changed, must be modified. And the fact that uh, it took so long to create this infrastructure and is moving slowly, it creates fragmentation. Fragmentation means that uh, your infrastructure is full of different incompatible components and they cannot work together. I think we are all, I may be wrong, but we are all uh, in some way working in the world of information technology, meaning IT with computers, etc. This is a world of operations technology where computers are tools that are not really seen as uh, like uh, the w in the same way developers look at them or, uh, uh, or administrators. Uh, we are talking about tools that are used by non-technical people or people who are technical in other sectors, not uh, in uh, information technology. And for them, it's something that it, sh it must be stable, it, it shouldn't be changed, it shouldn't be modified because uh, it would be a kind of uh, um, 
disruption that uh, may be negative from this point of view. This is what we call the whole thing that I just described is what I call a brown field. A brown field meaning something that is already available and it cannot go away. So again, if you have the typical IT attitude uh, of uh, changing things, let's redo it. You can't do it. You cannot do it in an environment like this. Uh, yes, in smart cities, you can start from scratch because cities don't have maybe this, uh, um, um, let's say, automated environments, but it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a particular case. In general, there are already infrastructures that you cannot change. So you have uh, a fragmentation in terms of uh, multiple protocols that they don't talk to each other. Some of you may know these names, like Canvas is basically the protocol that runs on your car. It's a just a serial protocol that uh, it, it's basic, meaning that then, guess what? Every car has a completely different implementation of Canvas. So if you have a Canvas analyzer for a Toyota Yaris, okay, you have on the other side a Mini or, a, I don't know, a Fiat 500, completely different things. And so developers have to work on uh, the Toyota Yaris and Canvas on the Toyota Yaris and the Canvas on the 500, etc. That's, that's how crazy, I would say, it is. <laughs> and so all the other possible uh, uh, protocols that are mostly used in uh, factories, in buildings for uh, air conditioning, lightning, electricity, etc. Uh, or, of course, more uh, typical things that you may know, like the Bluetooth or the low energy Bluetooth, uh, the Zigbee, which is a protocol which is mostly used, uh, for example, for your smart meters. I don't know how many of you, I think in Spain, for example, there are quite uh, many smart meters at home where you can immediately see what's going on, how much energy you are consuming in real time or, let's say, during the day, etc. And then there are all sorts of uh, industrial systems, um, like, uh, like uh, typical devices, robots, etc., or, or uh, um, protocols that are used to talk to the cloud. So you have uh, the sensors and the devices uh, on, uh, in a building or in a, in, a, in a factory, and then you have uh, cloud systems on top. And you have different protocols, again, that uh, are there. Why? Because, uh, for example, co-op is a very lightweight, but absolutely very similar to HTTP protocol, but is for constrained devices. It's for devices that are powered by the typical small batteries you find in the old watches, and they, last, uh, they must last for uh, months. Do it with HTTP, it will dry out the battery in a week. So that's the kind of example. Don't, don't even think about HTTPS because it's even worse, clearly. Um, and then there is complexity. So on one side, the mess of all the, uh, the, 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 the fragmentation. On the other side, the complexity of the infrastructure. You, first of all, everything that must be connected through networks. And uh, as soon as you have a network, you have a security issue. You start connecting something and there may be some hacking. And if you have a hacker who is uh, trying to see you through the MacBook uh, uh, webcam, okay, the, the, that might be a bad thing because maybe you're, okay. <laughs> but if somebody is trying to hack uh, maybe a power grid, it's a little bit more complicated and not that easy uh, to solve and fix, and you really, really want to make sure that these things don't happen. So security is number one priority, and it adds a huge level of complexity uh, in terms of authentication between components, in terms of data attestation. I want to make sure that the data that I am collecting and monitoring is coming exactly by this on, from these components and not something that has been hacked and modified in the meantime. They can, I mean, from a security point of view, the, you, people can really hack and uh, 
uh, apply like threats uh, in many, many different ways. Then we have reliability. The reliability of all the other components. Uh, here is another interesting point. And again, I'm an IT guy, and I work with OT operational guys uh, now for, uh, it's been a couple of years. Um, when they say, that was uh, the, the interesting point, oh, we need something that must be highly available. What does that mean? I mean, if I, I'm an IT guy, and for me, high availability means redundancy. Of course, I have one device, now I have two, and they work together. Nope. For OT, a highly available solution means something with better components. Like, oh, I can test that the device here, the hardware, it's uh, with the better standards. That's the, uh, the HA in their minds. Not always, but I'm saying uh, there may be uh, different, uh, different elements. And then the network is another element, uh, and you may have local area networks, but also wider area network and cellular. Uh, the fact that we have now 4G and 5G, or we will have 5G hopefully soon, um, is really making this possible. Um, and the whole life cycle of projects in IoT and IIoT and the whole management in terms of provisioning the system, configuring and changing, of course, updating and upgrading. Again, think about your uh, new version of watchOS and, uh, and think about how to upgrade uh, in a smart city like in Barcelona here, all these uh, pillars with the boards in there. I mean, how difficult and how complicated is that? It's like having a data center from a cloud system spread it all over a city. That's the example. All right. So I think you get it. You, you get the point, right? I, 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 I made a few, uh, maybe even too many examples. Uh, uh, OK, so what do we do? Right, this is the IT view. We think it's not a brown field with everything already predefined. We have a green field. We just destroy everything and put old stuff, new stuff there. Guess what? It's not possible, as I said. This is uh, from uh, a quite uh, active investor. I cannot show you the real thing because uh, it's copyrighted, but I can just tell you there are something in this landscape where, you know, usually uh, in databases, they show the names of the database servers around, like Oracle, DB2, and SQL Server, MySQL, etc. This is the landscape for IoT. Not for IoT, but for the un industrial Internet of Things. They have counted 971 companies active there. I mean, it's just crazy. It's insane, uh, the amount of uh, companies that uh, are active. And uh, number one point is machine learning and artificial intelligence. The fact that things must work on their own. They cannot, they should not be manually and humanly uh, handled. Um, again, this is not possible. It's not something that uh, can happen. And actually, I bet that 90%, uh, no, maybe not 90, but 80% of this 971 company will disappear in a matter of a couple of years. Yes, Stefan. Okay. And it works in all France and in all Europe. Yeah. Look, with super low frequency, you can put one antenna like every uh, 100 kilometers. Yes. And since that's happening, yeah. you will see it everywhere. Absolutely. For your body, for stability, for your car, everything. Exactly. And these are things that are, you're right, and uh, these are uh, the, the, the infrastructure uh, elements that are now evolving and they will be available for everybody. There are, this is an example, but there are lots of other examples worldwide and in Europe. Uh, okay, there are regulations and, uh, and uh, safety concerns, health concerns, which is good, I think. 
uh, you know, <laughs> I, I care of that. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, everywhere in the world, uh, there are uh, there are definitely new infrastructures that are, in, are, are going on. Um, the the fact is, and I really I hope that this will be a part of what you can take home. If you are or you will be involved in IoT and uh, in projects in Internet of Things, uh, okay. My recommendation is, and I'm part of, uh, as, uh, with, uh, with data, with Dynamic, uh, uh, from a data, data standpoint, uh, I'm part of the consortium that is looking after what is called fog computing. So if you all know what a cloud computing is, and you know that things happen in the cloud, the concept of fog computing is that in IoT there are multiple layers. Uh, the most well-known is the one down here at the edge. They call edge, we call edge everything that is related to the things that we use, manage, the devices that are working and executing something or the sensors that are monitoring something. And then these edge devices, they interact with systems that are in a more, uh, let's say, um, concentrated and uh, secure and well-powered environment, and usually it's the cloud. That's like saying in the good old days of the cloud server world, uh, we have two layers. Okay, the concept of fog is that in reality there are many layers. You cannot just go from here to there, or you cannot just uh, rely on the fact that you have constant connectivity between the edge and the cloud. You may, or you must actually, consider that this connectivity at some point is interrupted. So you cannot have communication for a while. What do you do then? You rely on your computation and storage, or you rely on a smaller amount of networking with uh, gateways. You may have a switch here or you may have multiple switches, regional uh, or area switches, etc. Okay, apply logic and use these parts. So this is very much related to how routers uh, or uh, gateways nowadays, they are programmable and they are maybe using Linux embedded, uh, like uh, the Yocto project uh, or the OpenRWRT. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but these are projects where Linux is used uh, inside these smart devices. And it's used in this way because you can then add extra software, so extra logic that can also help the edge devices. That's the way to refer to it. And you can, I mean, if you are a database guy and you are using databases, MySQL can work in there. Or uh, if, you, if you are going even lower on very, very small things, you can use SQLite or just in-memory structures. Or, like we had uh, from Stefan and Kentoku, the discussion about uh, um, Spider, you can have sharding on some of these small devices because, uh, again, you may have hundreds or thousands of devices and they're all connected locally. But the, the issue is mostly at many layers. So here, uh, again, we were talking about uh, smart cities. Uh, the perfect example of uh, fog computing is in a smart city, where you have a localized environment. And again, if you want to simplify it, think about in a street, you have a mini data center. You know that you have maybe these uh, small things that uh, they look like the old uh, telephone boxes, not boxes, but the, the concentrators where all the connections were there. Now there are Linux boards, I mean, like uh, Intel or Ambes boards with uh, Linux on board. And then uh, you can have uh, uh, storage and computation there. So in areas where you can control the traffic, you can, uh, you can uh, identify what the traffic is going on, you know, with cameras and connected to the traffic lights. And you can connect all the traffic lights together, for example, in a, in a, in a pretty long road and quite crowded. Or you can connect it to parking areas. Um, or uh, 
you may, you may suggest uh, where traffic should move from one uh, road, main road, to another, for example. How, how does this relate to fog computing? The relationship is that, yes, you have a cloud up there, but the analysis of this information is not only up there, it's also local. And it's not only in the local, uh, small uh, device that is in the traffic light, but it's uh, on a more uh, generic device that is taking control of the whole set in a block or few blocks of a road. Um, buildings are becoming data centers too. Smart buildings uh, control uh, humidity, temperature, uh, uh, power, uh, water usage, uh, um, people uh, uh, detection in terms of security or uh, in terms of uh, um, pollution, uh, fire, you name it. I mean, uh, it is literally like a, a living thing on its own uh, that is totally under control. And that's quite... I mean, you don't think about that. You enter into a building and you just, you know, use whatever is available. In reality, I mean, there is much, much more than that. Uh, and the evolution of this in the fog world is that these things, being all connected, can also work together. So the idea of the smart city where the roads are in some way controlled are related to the fact that uh, they can also interact uh, with the small or relatively small elements that are inside hospitals uh, or uh, connected to a highway which is nearby or factories or maybe events like sporting events. Uh, you, in the old good, good old days, you deployed policemen, moving staff, etc. In the new days, you basically upgrade uh, or uh, uh, automatically modify the way the traffic lights or the uh, big si signs uh, are organized uh, to redirect people for music events, sport events, etc. All of this is, uh, as I said, a pretty big uh, mess, to be honest, because uh, of all the protocols, uh, the devices that are incompatible, etc. So there is an attempt it's an attempt so far to create a regulation and a standardization with uh, a consortium called the Open Fog Consortium, which is the under the umbrella of uh, the IEEE organization, you know, that they basically create standards pretty much for everything. Uh, there are more than 65 members. I mean, that was uh, like a couple of months ago, and now there are already more than that. The founders are Microsoft, Dell, Arm, uh, Intel, Cisco, because of course for them it is uh, like a huge expansion of their business. Uh, uh, so they, are, they will sell more and more, and of course universities. Uh, and then there are other members uh, in uh, networking, etc. We are somewhere here. We are here. Okay. A tiny thing, we have the startup price, so it's way, way easier and less expensive. But all these guys are really working together to make uh, fog uh, a reality, something more than just uh, cloud computing for IoT. There are eight pillars that uh, are used to create a reference architecture. So, again, back to the point, uh, maybe today you're already involved in IoT, maybe in the future, I recommend you to just uh, take home uh, these elements. Consider the eight pillars on security, scalability, openness, autonomy, uh, reliability, agility, hierarchy, hierarchical structure, and programmability. Well, of course, uh, we don't have time to go into all these details of what that means, but uh, have a look at what is important for your project or for your infrastructure and focus on that because these are the aspects you should consider. And then you pick up the ones that are really relevant for your project or for your infrastructure. And uh, again, if you have already, if you are a DevOps guy, you can see that it's pretty much well-known stuff. It's nothing really new. Of course, scalability with orchestration uh, uh, and control of the way you spin up VMs uh, is important, obviously. Uh, and so the fact that uh, you have uh, 
uh, like uh, the hierarchical structure, the programmability of the hardware, software, etc. There is much more than just this uh, generic view. Uh, there is a, a reference architecture in the way uh, FOG should work, should be implemented. The reference architecture, if you are familiar with uh, uh, cloud architectures, is very similar. But there, there are two main obstacles and challenges. One, network. It's not like in a data center where the network is easy to manage. Here we are relying on wider networks, cellular networks, etc. And two, the size uh, of your uh, systems. We are not talking about a server that can just be, all right, let's have another 2U machine here. Oh, yes, of course, we need 500 watts power. No. Here we are relying on maybe sometimes servers this big. Other times, as I was saying, small things that uh, are powered by batteries or even by things that you don't even expect. Like uh, I was working with uh, a, a, a program, uh, um, a project from a University of Newcastle, so Michael might be happy with that, where there are sensors on good trains. Now, on train, it's easy. Today, you, you connect your laptop, right? Or you recharge your, your battery th uh, the for your smartphone. On good trains, on goods, there, are no, there is no power. How do you get power for the sensors? Uh, so they are studying. The movement is one option. They, were, uh, they found out that the biggest power comes from vibrations. So vibration generates power to power the sensors and the network on the train. That's uh, the example, you know, what, uh, what you can do. But, okay, that said, the reference architecture is very similar, meaning that you have, uh, similar to the cloud, as I said, you have the real hardware, and sometimes you just use the hardware, or you create a virtualized environment, and so you can have virtualization if you have enough power to handle a virtualized layer, because, of course, virtualized layers uh, must compute, and the computation cost. It costs power, it costs power, and uh, um, it costs uh, the availability do, to do other computation on top. Maybe at some point you don't have enough power to, to do your job with the, with the virtualized environment and, uh, at the at lower level. Um, and so it's the same thing. Uh, it's an environment where uh, hypervisors and VMs uh, are coming up on uh, large uh, or relatively large uh, elements, components. Uh, C, in terms of programming, is still the main uh, used uh, language, but things are evolving into scripting languages, uh, and Java is coming heavily. Uh, but there are still, again, problems with uh, power consumption and, uh, and uh, really hardware uh, um, optimization. And then you have applications that are more vertical on uh, the security, on the data analytics, for example. Um, so databases, in the same idea of a old, the original cloud, uh, a database service was not part of this infrastructure. It was just a vertical element. And then people realized that mm, maybe the database is part of the infrastructure. And now, for example, you have RDS or uh, other examples. OK. So far, I think I showed you something that came from uh, people uh, involved in consortiums, uh, uh, general views. This is more my view. What I, I mean, as part of dynamic and what we are trying, and I'm not, I'm not selling, actually, we, by the way, provide open source software, so we, we are not, I'm not here to sell anything, but I'm showing you a view. And the view is actually very much in the open source direction, meaning that in the very same way that uh, the whole IT world has evolved, uh, IoT will evolve, in my opinion, and then you may have yours and agree or disagree in the same way. So there will be a stack. The Java stack is an example. Maybe it's not the best one, but I'm not a big Java fan, but I think that is probably it will be the winner in IoT because uh, the big guys are really betting on this and they are literally 
deploying hardware to make it better. But still not yet. I think it will take some time. I don't know if you've ever seen this mess. This is OpenStack. Has anybody been involved or used OpenStack? One person, two. Okay. I mean, it's a great, wonderful project, but it's huge. And it's all basically related to data centers. Okay, OpenStack, I think it will be, there will be a kind of OpenStack for IoT in the, in the future, in the near future, because there, there are lots of projects that are going on that will go into that direction. The d issue is that OpenStack, again, is all related to big iron, big machines running in the data center. But now you need to change uh, the view on that. And here is why I'm saying uh, OpenStack is quite interesting. On this side, you have uh, the current number, uh, maybe not current, maybe it's a few months old, of projects in the OpenStack world. There are something like 45 projects running in parallel. And these are the challenges in uh, fog computing that are in some way close to what you see here. It's not a one-to-one -one match, but it's very, very close. And that's why I believe that uh, OpenStack, uh, a sort of OpenStack-like uh, structure will come from the OpenFog consortium, etc. So you should watch this space if you're interested. And just to give you an idea of the huge uh, cost and, uh, uh, and real involvement, uh, this is what we have today with OpenStack. More than 9 million lines of code. It's, uh, it's something unbelievable. Well, not unbelievable, but uh, pretty, pretty interesting. And the number of contributors, etc. cetera. Um, maybe today, the best example of what can run on the current hardware is the good old uh, lamp with Linux because Linux can run really on, so on very, very small constrained device. Some sort of web server. Maybe I'm not talking about a web server for interaction, but I'm talking about something that can provide a REST API, for example. Uh, and uh, maybe scripting. And of course, databases. OK, maybe. And I'm not referring to the fact that you can run maybe Perl or MySQL, etc. No, I'm referring to the stack itself. A database of some sort a language of some sort, and a web uh, uh, or uh, a, 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 an HTTP server and, uh, and, the, and the operating system. Linux will be definitely, or it is now already, the number one choice. There are already open source projects out there. I don't know if you ever heard of uh, this, of one of these. Um, now, I try to capture some, and there are, of course, many others, because they come up every week. There is a new one. Uh, Ka and uh, IOFOG and Kura are Java-based. Uh, these others are C, C++, Ajax is Go. Um, I, I think that these two guys are, I mean, there are lots of uh, interesting features in CA, for example. It's a framework for IoT, but it's basically, I wouldn't say dead, but uh, kind of uh, going down. Less and less contributions, and the rec most recent one is uh, six months old. Um, IOFOG is similar. Um, EDGEX is probably the most active one is part of the Linux Foundation, and it's backed by VMware, Dell, uh, and, uh, well, many other companies that uh, I would say they're mostly watching. So that's another, like, uh, like uh, Fredrik said, camera off, because they're, they're, they, they are there, but they're not doing much. Um, the idea is to have uh, a an open source uh, fog infrastructure to connect everything together. Uh, the goodness of this is that it is really an ambitious project working on a lots of uh, uh, elements that are integrated, etc. Um, 
I think that uh, the not great idea of this is that they are trying to do everything on their own. And it's a huge work and it's not scalable. So yes, it's open source. No, they are not using the idea of open source, number one, which is collaboration. They're not, uh, they're not really working from a collaboration point of view here. And uh, just to support what I'm saying, this is a, an overview of their reference architecture, which is pretty, pretty large. Uh, Kura is from Eclipse. So this is from the Eclipse Foundation, and Eclipse is uh, very, very much active in IoT. It's all uh, uh, Java, pretty much. It's another framework, um, very much focused on control and management of these components. So they have reduced the scope, uh, and uh, specifically management, I would say, more than control. So again, this is probably something good. Um, and uh, Foglamp, we talked about that yesterday. It's what we are doing. Uh, it is uh, a C and a little bit of Python, hopefully less and less. Microservices architecture, where for service, by service I mean uh, components that are running, like uh, in the smart gateways, you can install it and run it, or you can move it from a smart gateway to a small device like a Raspberry Pi or something even smaller. Um, but there will be slides available, so you can look at that later. Okay. Um, I'm almost there, sorry, and I know that I'm already running quite late. Um, how can these guys make money? Meaning that, yes, they are open source, but they need to pay their salaries, etc. Well, that's an interesting point. Uh, it's such a huge environment and so many projects are out there that everybody is predicting that there will be lots of acquisitions, lots of sales. And so if you have a platform, uh, you are very likely that you will be, the platform will be acquired by somebody. The picture is uh, because uh, I used to say this is a pass the parcel thing. When you take open source and instead of making money, you sell it to somebody and uh, somebody else will make money with that, hopefully. I know, it's a long story. If you are interested, uh, you can find me by the coffee machine or somewhere and I can tell you something more about that. Or you can go with uh, services around it, typical technical support, consulting, etc. Uh, there is a comparison chart, chart that I tried hard to create, not easy, to identify what Eclipse uh, EdgeX and Foglamp, and these are elements of non-real uh, uh, infrastructures, but uh, uh, Apache Foundation and uh, Cisco, they have something that can work uh, in this environment, mostly open, for, uh, open source. And uh, there is a difference, again, I will leave you the slides and you can look at what are actually the components in terms of uh, uh, devices, gateways, so in the Fog environment, and then cloud uh, components. That is pretty much the, 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 the environment. Okay, so just to summarize, the takeaways I think are pretty clear. We think that uh, it's not just cloud, it is fog, multiple layers. Uh, if we must preserve uh, the existing infrastructures because they are not going away, nobody is throwing away millions if not billions of euros of infrastructure, and open source is the only way to go, as, if, as we have seen also in IT. It's impossible to achieve something like this without open source software. Uh, if you are involved in a project like this, this is number one rule. Think small and even smaller, because your software will probably run on small, very, very small and low co power consumption systems. That's what we have. All right. I don't think, I don't know if we have another, there is another talk after this? Yes. Okay. So I, I must leave it. Thank you. <laughs>